My next guest is a former professor of moral theology at St. Joseph Seminary in New York, currently a visiting scholar at the McGrath Institute of Church Life at Notre Dame. He's long been an advocate for abuse victims, here to weigh in on the case of disgraced Jesuit Marco Rupnik and the testimony this week from one of his victims. Please welcome back to the program Father Thomas Berg. Thank you for being here, Father. Uh, it's been five years since the Vatican Sex Abuse Summit in 2019, where Pope Francis famously said he would confront clergy sex abusers with the wrath of God, zero tolerance. This week, a victim of the disgraced Jesuit priest and artist Marco Rubnik came forward under her own name to detail her ordeal. 59-year-old Gloria Branciani, accompanied by another former member of the order, spoke of physical, psychological, and sexual abuses endured at the hands of Rupnik. Just to recap for our viewers, Rupnik, now 69, is accused of sexually and psychologically abusing at least 20 women for nearly two decades at a convent in Slovenia. Father, why do you think they held this press conference now, and why wasn't it held or hosted by the Vatican? I think they held it now, Raymond, because they felt a desperate need to be heard. Um, mm. And before I say anything else, I just want to validate and honor the, the courage that it took uh, Gloria and, and Miriam to, uh, to come forward. Uh, my understanding is that in one case, uh, the alleged abuse happened over 30 years ago. So this is 30 years of what of what uh, a victim of abuse most wants in terms of justice, which is to be hurt. Mm. If you've been, forgive me, but raped by a priest, mm. what you most want is for someone in leadership in the church to hear you and validate you and say, I believe you. And I think if they had to go to this extreme, um, it's because they weren't getting that. I, I have heard uh, from someone who was at the, the conference that they, they did express that they did feel that they were finally heard yesterday. But I think mm. this speaks to the brokenness of, in, in many ways, still the church's response to this crisis. Father, Ms. Branciani's testimony included her statements to the following. She said, he took me to pornographic theaters to help me grow spiritually. He said that I would not grow spiritually if I did not meet his sexual needs. He had another nun have sex with us because he said we were like the Trinity. I mean, this is, I, I can't even get to some of the other uh, really depraved accusations, Father, but these statements alone confirm what we've been hearing about this Rupnik case, that he would manipulate his victims by using faith, not to mention the confessional. Your thoughts on why he was able to get away with this for so long? Because um, these individuals um, are uh, kind of masterminds at manipulation. Um, I think you know my my own story, my history with the Legionaries of Christ, and the, the experience yep. of Marcial Maciel. Um, they are masters at manipulation, spiritual manipulation. Um, besides the emotional, psychological, sexual abuse, this is spiritual abuse. This is false mysticism. Mm -hmm. This is this is simply demonic. Uh, and and um, so, it, it, a person who is then vulnerable as all of these uh, women. There were women religious at the time. They were members right. of the Saloyola community that he had founded. There's just a tremendous vulnerability when this individual that you put on a pedestal as a spiritual leader, as a spiritual father is, um, there's just a, and, and especially if you're living kind of a, a mystique of, of generosity and self-gift and and an absolute trust mm -hmm. and the absolute surrender of your will and your intellect to, I mean, these poor women were absolutely wide open to this monster. And in the church, in church circles, he was regarded as this great artiste, you know, decorating all the sanctuaries of the world and being feted and, and toasted everywhere he went. Rupnik was briefly excommunicated, Father Berg, in 2020 for absolving one of his victims of having relations with him. 
And then he was reinstated after supposedly repenting formally. Then last June, he's expelled from the Jesuits only to be reincarnated to the Diocese of Slovenia in October. Why does the Vatican and the church at large seem so willing to turn a blind eye to this abuse? I mean, the abuse of adults, particularly women religious. Um, part of its part of its process, I think a lot of it is a, uh, a culture, uh, a deep culture of resistance to the truth. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But part of this is process. Um, the uh, can canonical penal system for dealing with these cases is absolutely broken. Um, and there's just no getting around that. And that's how you uh, end up with this uh, cockamamie uh, outcome of being excommunicated for a horrendous uh, and also mm -hmm. sacrilegious crime. And then within the same month, having the excommunication lifted. Um, and I think there was some sense that uh, the powers that be got that so bad and so messed up that Francis did have to intervene and, and say, no, this is going back to the DDF. Um, to the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith. Um, but I, I, I have to say, Raymond, I don't believe that, you know, to, to really to fix this problem, um, I don't think that tweaking the system or adjusting the code of canon law, um, even a wholesale reform of our penal process is going to solve the problem. I mean, I think we need an entirely new approach to the concept of justice right now that system is it's built on a concept of retributive justice. It's aimed it's specifically focused on uh, retribution. Um, it's focused on the perpetrator. We need a system that really focuses on the victims and on justice for the victims. And that's um, mm -hmm. I'm very much an advocate of another approach, which is the, the tradition of restorative justice. Um, and I, I think that if we could apply that to this crisis more and more. You know, restorative justice, you, you think of um, its application in places like South Africa after apartheid and Rwanda mm -hmm. uh, after the genocide, national truth commissions. How much would the mm -hmm. church be served by a national yeah. uh, truth commission to get at, to really get at what happened with McCarrick, to now yeah. get at what happened with Rupnik? Um, in, in that's approach that really seeks the good and the healing of yeah. the victims. That also takes a lot of soul searching, and it looks like people are not willing to do that. I mean, as you mentioned, oh, sure. the guy's excommunicated. Before, before you can turn around, the excommunication is lifted, and now, suddenly, the Vatican Press Office announces the same day these victims held their press conference that the investigation of Rupnik is ongoing. They said the following. After expanding the search to realities not previously contacted and having just received the latest elements in response, it will now be necessary to study the acquired documentation in order to identify which procedures can and should be implemented. Now, Father, I, I don't even know how to translate that, but this thing's been dragging on for years. What procedures do they need to consult? These women are in pain and have been in, in such pain for decades now. It's, it's maddening, and I hope every one of our viewers understands that this is maddening. Um, and the upshot is going to be, well, okay, well, what would, what would be the outcome then? Like the worst thing that could happen to this man, worst thing that can happen to this man uh, through a penal process is that he's laicized. Wow. Okay. So that, um, that outcome means little or nothing for, for victims. And the process itself is so um, uh, troubled by just it, it, the, the inability for victims to, when they do have to give their testimony, to be accompanied by counsel, not knowing the outcomes, mm -hmm. not being able to see uh, evidence that, that's it. it and, and as you say, it's <laughs> what, what is there more to, you know, to examine here? Obviously, yes, they have to follow the process, right? And and but my problem mm. is that the process itself is is deeply, deeply flawed. And and even yeah. when that when that process is done, even if this man is eventually 
um, lay aside, you're still going to have victims who are hurting, uh, victims who do not yet have a sense that they've received justice, and we need a, a, a complete new approach to to this uh, to this ongoing crisis. And Father, again, you have an institution investigating itself. Final question: Is an independent criminal investigation what is needed here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've been saying that for forever, and and I know that uh, mm -hmm. at the uh, the. Uh, press conference yesterday was organized by uh, Ann Barrett Doyle from Bishop Accountability, and she's, she also called mm -hmm. for, as, as, many, as many have, why, why cannot, you know, bishops, uh, a, a, a bishops examining priests, bishops uh, examining uh, bishops uh, and trying to hold them accountable, just it, it, it doesn't work. And also given the, at times, the intricacies of these cases. Um, but what we need, what we really need is an accounting. Um, but more deeply than that, the problem is, and this I think this gets down to the echelons of the, deeply within Vatican bureaucracy, um, and I think also especially within, still within the Italian church, persons have told me that they're still about 20 years behind the United States in terms of dealing with this crisis. Um, there's a deep resistance to truth, okay? The whole, the value of transparency, that has not even begun to seep into the places where it needs to seep in. Um, there's too many clerics, too many prelates in power who have a real problem with facing the truth of, of the, the, the whole truth of, of this sad uh, chapter in the church, which, by the way, sadly, it stretches back centuries. So we have a huge, yeah. huge problem. Um, if anything, yeah. I don't believe we needed a synod on synodality. We needed a, a, a synod, a gathering of every bishop in the church to actually deal, look at, come together, come to grips on the depth, complexity, and extent of uh, se sexual abuse in the church by clergy and by others in leadership. Hmm. Father Thomas Berg, we will leave it there, and we'll check in with you soon. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks for having me.